Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Vineyard. My name is Carol Ann. I am on staff here at the church, and it's so good to see you all this morning. I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm so glad you guys chose to spend part of your weekend here with us, celebrating Jesus, celebrating who he is, growing together. We're all about uh, loving Jesus, growing together, and giving back here at the church, so we get to do some of those things together today. Uh, If you're new, I'm especially glad you're here. You should have grabbed a little program on your way in. It just has some information about the church, some upcoming events, things you can be aware of. So check that out. Uh, But right now, we get to do the the loving Jesus part of our values this morning by worshiping him. And as I was preparing uh, my own heart for worship this week, I felt like the Lord uh, stopped me in this passage in Luke 8. I've been going through the book of Luke. And there's this story in the chapter of Uh, the book of Luke, chapter 8, where Jesus heals a man who had many demons. And he's actually, this man was described as uh, having demons for a long time. Like he says he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. It also describes him as being kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. Like this was a man who was so tormented by the demons inside that Uh, He was becoming violent. Like the people around him had to contain him because they didn't know what to do. They didn't have any way to help him. And then the cool thing is, is that he had one encounter with Jesus and Jesus sets him free from all of it. Like Jesus redeems him. He sets him free from the demons that uh, were tormenting him for a long time. This man was restored to a position where he could have a house. He could be around people. He didn't have to be chained and bound with shackles anymore, but he was free. And what I love down in verse 39 is Jesus gives him this command. Jesus told the man this. He said, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. It says, he went away, the man, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. And as I thought about worship this morning, it just challenged my heart to consider what God has done for me, what God has done for us in this church. Um, And the challenge for us is to declare how much God has done, to proclaim, which is what we get to do in worship right now. We're going to sing a song that's literally called What He's Done, and it's recognizing exactly that. It's recognizing who Jesus is and what he's done for us, and it challenges us to give him the glory and honor that he deserves for those things. So I'm going to invite you guys to stand, and we're going to practice this. We're going to uh, recognize what God has done for each of us and worship him for it. So let's pray before we worship. Jesus, I thank you that you are a God who is active. You are a God who doesn't just leave us in our mess, but you come in and you redeem us, you set us free, you call us by a new name. And so I pray, Lord, that you would bring back to mind right now all the ways that you've been faithful, the things that you have done that we can give you honor and glory for. And so we just invite you into this time, Lord, And as always, Jesus, we pray that it's so honoring and so loving to you. Let's pray a blessing over Leah and the entire worship team as they lead us. In Jesus' name.
a new song to you today. It's called Holy Forever. You might have heard this song before, uh, but as we worship through it, we're just going to get an opportunity to, again, thank Jesus for what he did, but not only that, to, it's more to recognize his authority um, and his position in heaven because of all of those things that he did for us. And as I was thinking about the lyrics of this song, a scripture came to my mind from the book of Philippians. It's in chapter two. I'm going to start reading in verse nine. uh, But before the verse that I'm about to read, it describes again, all of the things that Jesus did, that he came to earth. Uh, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on a cross for our sins. And it goes on to say that because of all these things, God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's the Jesus Christ that we get to worship through this song. And so I'm excited to worship with you. We're going to start with the chorus. Uh, We'll sing through it a couple times and then jump into the rest of the song. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cry. Stands above them all. 
and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations see worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day That's what we say is that you are holy. Lord, we thank you that we had time to recognize your holiness, to recognize who you are, what you've done, to celebrate what you will do, what we'll experience someday in heaven with you, Jesus. So we just thank you, Lord, for the time we had to focus on you, to set everything else aside and focus on you. And Lord, I pray and hope that you felt like you were the center of our attention during this time of worship, Lord. And as always, we hope that it felt loving, that it was honoring to you, that you felt glorified and lifted up through our worship. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us this morning. Hey, if you are in middle school, you can head on out. Your core class leader will meet you in the hall. The rest of you take 30 seconds. Be friendly. Say hi to the people around you. Then you can have a seat. I'm Christy Camacho. And I'm Sarah Kovach. We're both on staff here at the Vineyard and we're so glad you're here today. Did you know getting more connected at the Vineyard can be as easy as filling out one of these connect cards? It puts you in contact with a staff member and gets you notified of some first steps in getting more connected. If you're on site, the card is in the seat back right in front of you and you can drop that off at the Welcome Center in the atrium or you can simply scan the QR code to fill it out electronically. Put a finger down if you've ever had to turn the knob on a TV to change the channel. Put a finger down if you've ever swooned over Donny Osmond. Put a finger down if you've ever shopped through the Sears catalog. Put a finger down if you've had shag carpet in your home. Put a finger down if you've ever spent your Saturday morning watching American Bandstand. If you can relate to some, or maybe even all of those, Vintage is the event for you. 
Odds are, throughout your life, you've learned the value that connection with others has. In this stage of life, you may have a little more free time on your hands than you did previously, and now is a great time to engage with others over a potluck dinner while worshiping together and hearing a special message. You can learn more about it in your program and can sign up at the Resource Center in the atrium after service today. Here at Vineyard, we say yes to the adventure of a life of faith and yes to each other, which is why growing together is one of the core values of our church. We aim to show up as our real selves and pitch in to take care of each other. And the more time you spend around the same people, the more they get to know you and the more you'll have in common. This can happen over the course of a few hours at a conference like the Flourish Women's Conference or over the course of a few months through a Vineyard group. Ladies, the Flourish Women's Conference is at the end of the month at a Vineyard Church in Goshen, but this weekend is the last chance to sign up for this two-day conference that focuses on growing faith and friendships through worship, teaching, and so much more. And if you missed out on last weekend's Vineyard Group launch, it's not too late to find a group to adventure through life together with. You can find all open groups at the group's wall by the Resource Center or online at thevineyard.org groups. We're about to move into our message time. So before we go, for those on site, if you've kept your cell phone on, we ask that you turn that on silent now. And if you chose to keep a child with you and they get a little restless, we ask that you take them out to the atrium where you can still watch and listen to the message out by the fireplace. Thanks, Thanks Vineyard! Vineyard. Good morning, you guys. My name is Mark Pope. I'm the lead pastor here at the church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, what? You're a little late. We're like, we, we were moving on, but um, <laughs> also want to say hi to folks online. If you're uh, joining us online, hopefully you're having a good morning. Uh, a couple things for me before we get into the talk. Following the service, there's an Exploring the Pastoral Care Team. Uh, we have a church family, pretty, actually it's a fairly large church family, and every once in a while there'll be people in our church family that end up in a difficulty, hospital uh, situation, or even long-term care, and they'll find themselves separate from what we do on the weekends. And what we're trying to do is to develop more of a team that will visit people in this situation, because, uh, right, church family uh, isn't just distinguished by whether you can be here on the weekend. They, we, like, if you're not, you still matter if you're part of our church family. Um, and so this is a team that would uh, visit, pray with folks, have a conversation, maybe offer them communion, just try to represent Christ to these people. Uh, one of the unique things about the team a little bit is uh, there'd be some flexibility in your schedule if you decide to be on this team. It's not driven by the weekends. Most of these visits would happen through the week with some flexibility. Uh, super, I think, important that this gets developed. So if you're curious at all about that, following the service, just pop in to the chapel. It's a pretty short exploring meeting, maybe 10 minutes at the max. And I thought, uh, I thought I would also encourage, just in case uh, some of the younger folks are thinking, oh, that sounds like something for old people. Maybe not. How about uh, it would be enjoyable uh, for us old people to get a visit from someone who's not old? <laughs> just in case you kind of categorize that as something. And uh, the other thing is there's a real... The richness of the presence of God is not limited by age. Have you, have you met some of the young people in the church, younger people, 20-something, and uh, maturity is, spiritual maturity is not dictated by chronological age. And so, uh, if you, all right, done with that. Um, I want to share a scripture before we pray for the offering. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, 
Who makes you different from anyone else? By the way, it doesn't say what makes you different. Who? It's a reference to God. What do you have that you did not receive? And regarding the offering, one of the things that giving an offering or tithing back to the Lord does is it acknowledges that God is the giver of our resources. And uh, that's important. So as you give, if, you, if you're not giving or if you're thinking about giving, I would encourage you, or maybe you're a person who needs reminded every once in a while, hey, offering is important. It's one of those moments where we just acknowledge, by the way, the things that I've received in my life, God has given me those things. So just an encouragement there. Let's pray about the offering. Father, whether we give through the boxes or electronically somehow, We hope that you feel loved and that our offerings this weekend would just uh, honor your position in the universe as creator and as the giver uh, of all things, all good things. And as usual, we ask that you give us wisdom as a church with any financial decisions that we need to make because we want to be great stewards of your money. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible, chapter 25 today. Uh, Opening thought, there's a television show that was pretty popular up until maybe just a few years ago. It was called Deal or No Deal. Anybody remember the show? How many of you have seen Deal or No Deal? Okay, quite a few, bunch of us. Reminder, I'll try to remind you of how the show goes in case you don't know it well. There's a contestant, and the contestant chooses one of 26 different briefcases. Inside the briefcases are monetary values of everything from a penny up to a million. There's a million dollar briefcase. And then the contestant goes through a series of kind of decisions as as the different briefcases are limited. And ultimately, they hope at the end of the show, they end up with like the million dollar case. Uh, The other twist in the show is every once in a while, they will be offered a deal to basically take a guaranteed sum of money, and then it'll be over. Like, so if there's a number of different cases left with different dollar values, they might say, okay, well, there's a, you know, a $75 case, and all these other things, they'll say, we'll give you, you know, $26,000 guaranteed right now to finish the show, and you can walk away with that. And then the purse, that's when they say, deal or no deal. And the person either takes the deal or they say, no. All right, you ready? You got it? This is a specific story of Luis. Here's a picture of Luis. Went through the entire show. He ended up, at the end, he's either going to get the five, a $5 case or the $750,000 case. That's quite a difference, isn't it? $5 or $750,000. And so then they interrupt the show and, uh, and Howie Mendel says, wait, okay, here's the deal we're going to offer you, a guaranteed $333,000, right? So do you want to risk that or guaranteed $333,000, deal or no deal? All right, pause. How many of you would take the deal, the 300 guaranteed, like, okay, how many of you would risk it and go for, you guys are nuts, you really would do that. Wait, raise your hand, we're identifying you as mentally unstable, one, two, three, four, no, no, there's a dozen of you, okay, it's valid, no, um, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. So, on the, and on, but on the television show with Luis, you want to know how it turned out, Luis, like, his family that was kind of there and the audience, everybody was saying, take the deal. They were like, most of us, take the deal. Guess what he did? No deal. You know what he ended up with? Five bucks. And as I was watching the video clip of that, the thing, one thing that came to my mind is, you're dumb. Luis, I, with all the love in my heart, I was thinking <laughs> that was dumb because that was a bad deal. That brings up a question that we're going to deal with a little bit today. Have you ever made a bad deal? Sure. We all probably have in some ways. 
I recently was at a secondhand shop and bought, I think, three, two shirt, three shirts. And I got them home and tried them on again and thought, I'll never wear this. I never wore any of them. That was a bad deal. Sometimes it's a bigger thing than that. Maybe you have, a, have had a purchase, a car purchase, and you thought, oh, this will be good. And then you end up realizing in hindsight, that was not the best deal. By the way, the Bible records different times in history where God's people or potential pe- God's potential people would just make bad deals. A couple of examples. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a man, here's his, the deal he offers him. He says, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then he says, then come follow me. I think this is an invitation for him to be one of the core disciples in the Bible. That, that would be a good deal, by the way, but the guy declines. That's a bad deal. In Mark 4, no, 8, 36, says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? That's, that would be, that's an important decision. And Matthew 26 tells the story of Judas. He was one of the disciples, the disciple that betrayed Jesus Christ. And he did it for 30 pieces of silver. Judas ends up in hell for 30 coins. That's a bad deal. Hold the thoughts. We're in a series called Drifters. When wandering turns into tragedy. We're kind of learning from some of the uh, epic fails in the Bible. And today we're going to look at a guy who makes a really bad decision on a deal. His name is Esau. It's a story of these brothers, Esau and Jacob. So there's one historical fact that uh, I want to let you in on before we read the story. It'll help the story make sense. Family line or lineage is important in uh, the Scripture. It's important to God in many ways. But that's why when you read the Bible, there are times you'll get to pages that says, like, so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, and and -and so-and-so was the father of so-and-so. And And they have these law. It's the pages that a lot of times you skip. You know, you get eight names into it, and you go, I can't pronounce these anyway, so you just bounce to the end. So anyway, so lineage is important. The other thing is, in the Old Testament, uh, where we're going to read today, uh, birth order. If you were the firstborn, the firstborn son, especially, that was a big deal. Here uh, in our text, it's going to call it the birthright. Here's what that means. Birthright usually refers to the right of the son born first in a family to inherit his father's possessions and authority. In ancient Israel, all the sons received some of their father's property, but the firstborn received a double portion and became the leader of the family. So that's a pretty big deal. So in today's text, you may have heard of Abraham, Isaac. Isaac marries Rebecca, and Rebecca is pregnant, and she's not just pregnant with one, she's going to have twins. So that'll be a little. That's interesting if the firstborn, because you're going to have two, well, apparently it matters which one comes out first. And so that's the, that's the context here, picking it up in verse 24. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So he's like a hairy ginger. ish. All right. And his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. So Esau is the firstborn. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Bounce to verse 27. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter. That's the firstborn, redheaded, hairy guy. A man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. 
Isaac, that's the father, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau, firstborn uh, outdoorsman, came in from the open country famished, and he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew, I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. That's a big deal. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on an oath, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stool. Stu, stool. <laughs> No, nope, that would be a different thing, especially if you work in a hospital. <laughs> Sorry about that one. <laughs> That's a bad deal. <laughs> he, shouldn't have, he shouldn't have sold his birthright for that. <laughs> I can't go on. That was a bad one. We should put that in the blooper reel. So he ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. And in the midst of it, that is a horrible deal. You know, he sold double inheritance, all this stuff, for a bowl of soup and a piece of bread. Bad deal. Side note as well, even today when you get to know more about the Bible and biblical history, you'll hear about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It could have been so different. It would have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. This one decision, really bad deal. Title of the talk is Esau. Probably the worst, I'm sorry, possibly the worst trade ever. And we're going to explore how it happened and a couple principles that can guard us from making a really bad deal, physically, financially, spiritually. These are good cautions. So let me pray. Lord, um, will you give us things today that will be protections to us in the future that we might make wise choices? Be our teacher, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got two ideas from the text. It's basically how bad deals come about. The first one is this. Bad deals come from... What we're going to call unbridled urges. It's like moving recklessly, quickly. In verse 30, if you have that written down, in verse 30, it's Esau says to Jacob, I just noticed quick. He says, quick. Let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished, exclamation point. And in verse 32, he says, I'm about to die. When I read that, I'm, a, I'm about to die. I think, do you exaggerate very much, Esau? Because my guess is, well, maybe he was, but my guess, he really isn't about to die, but he's just really, really hungry. And he comes in with his urgency, this thing. By the way, this word quick uh, it could be translated, I pray, it means now, I entreat you, I beseech you, I implore you. It's a very strong word, probably an emotionally driven word. Some other ways that this same sentence has been translated, the New Living Translation says, Esau said, I'm starved, exclamation point, give me some of that red stew. Another version says, let me eat some of that red stew. I am exhausted. I also chose the King James Version because it's just interesting to me, the language. It comes in, he says, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. I just picture, you know, the, the, the old English, ah, brother, <laughs> feed, feed me, I pray thee. 
some of that pottage. Anyway, <laughs> well, that was kind of fun. But anyway, it happened. He comes with this urgent, emotional, now, I got to have it, now. And it provokes a question for us, how many bad consequences are connected to quick decisions? A lot. Think about it in your life. Have you made any really bad decisions? And it's because you made them too fast. Uh, the first time I ever drank uh, alcohol, just thought I'd clarify there in case you're like, oh, yeah. I was a senior in high school at a graduation party, and Tony, uh, by the way, I was pretty content not to drink. I didn't grow up in a, in a drinking household, wasn't really. And, and Tony, at the party, he had a real urgency, and so he started doing this, come on, Pope, come on, man, we're going to graduate. Let me make you a drink. It would just be awesome, right? It's, you know how that, that, that thing, you know, it's like, come on, Pope, come on. Let me make you a drink. It would be the best thing ever. Right, right, right. But I don't know what I was thinking. So I'm like, yeah, after he kind of wore me down, I'm like, okay, whatever, Tony, make me a drink, and I'll drink it for you. That'll make you happy. So then he makes me uh, what I think he called a Tony special. <laughs> Should have been a warning side. I just didn't know. Put it in, one of, in a big styrofoam cup. He's like, here, this would be great. So I remember, I still remember, like, like whether I smelled it or tasted it and thought, I'm not sure you're supposed to ingest. This doesn't, really? This is what we're going to drink? And so I think I tasted a little bit and thought, you got to be kidding me. And then, you, so you know what I did? I just thought, I'll, I'll just drink it fast. <laughs> so I just took the whole thing and chugged it. Oh, God. That's bad. I, and it, it's the, it, got, it got bad that night. And by the way, it's one of those moments where, you know, another word that probably ap applies in here is hasty. It's just hasty decisions. And that's one of the moments in my life, if I could go back and change just that one hasty decision, I would go back and change that. And I would have said, no, I don't want that. Because not like, not like some people struggle with alcohol, but that set me up for multiple different times I was tempted or fell or did things I never would have done had I never made that first hasty decision. Does that make sense? We make some really bad decisions with, when we're just urgent and move too fast and don't think through the situation. We make financial decisions that are sometimes hurtful, relational decisions. I've done some marriage counseling with different people, and sometimes their story will be even something like, oh, yeah, well, we got engaged on our third date. And you go, oh, maybe that's why we're in counseling now. Because <laughs> after three days, that's pretty fast. Or spiritually, spiritually, we should be running our decisions through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God and with the counsel of godly people and just through prayer, and instead we just go, oh yeah, we're just going to go do this. And we would do better to slow down and get God involved. It reminded me of the reality that there's nothing in Scripture that records Jesus ever running even though he dealt with what many of us would describe as emergency situations. He doesn't run. Now, does he have urgency? Is he intentional? Absolutely. Does he get a lot of things done? Absolutely. But he never runs. There's record in John 4 of Jesus sitting down and having a conversation with a woman. In Luke 4... This is just before he starts his public ministry. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He goes out alone, fasts and prays for 40 days in preparation. Just think about that. He set aside 40 days being alone. He was tempted. That's a long, that is a slow process before he gets launched into ministry. One of my favorite examples of Jesus' pace in life 
is this is after his resurrection, and a lot of disciples and followers were just confused. Like he died on the cross, but now he's not in the grave. And so there were two of his disciples that were headed toward a village called Emmaus, which was about a seven, seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're out on this seven-mile walk. It'd be, you could compare it to like going from here to Elkhart County. That's a long walk. It's going to take you several hours. And it says, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. I assume Jesus knew his plan was to reveal himself to them. He didn't reveal who he was till the end of the walk and then a little bit after. I think it speaks to Jesus' pace. So, here's a question for us. Is my pace prone to making good decisions? That's the application. And you might pause and think of the different hats you wear, different areas of responsibility, Does my pace help me make good decisions relationally? Your marriage, if you're married, your dating relationships. If you're a parent, are you going too fast to make good decisions in raising your kids? It it affects finances. Spiritually, are we going too fast to get godly counsel from others, include God in prayer? Like, do you, do you make decisions and then they get messy and then you go, oh, hey God, why is this a mess? And he's like, yeah, because you didn't talk to me. Well, but now can you fix it? There's a real wisdom in by the way, I don't think we, we, we don't call a walk with God a run with God. It's a walk with God. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. By the way, if you want to practice this, we're doing uh, prayer and worship gatherings, which I just enjoy the pace of them. You don't have to go for the whole time. It's an hour and a half, but you can tend for 20 minutes. We just do these And it might add to you a spiritual discipline of the ability to go slow. By the way, for some of you who get a lot of stuff done and you're quick moving and urgent and all that stuff, I'm not saying change that is who you are. I'm saying make sure you add to your skills the ability to pause and slow down at times. It'll help us ultimately be productive. All right, so that was the first idea. Bad deals come from unbridled urges. And the second one is they come from unrecognized enemies. A story before we get back into the text. Uh, I'm letting you write that down, sorry. Unrecognized enemies. Did I fill in all the blanks so far or did I miss one? Did I miss one? Oh, okay. We shall, I beseech thee, let us go back and Fixeth. Is my pace prone to making good decisions? Did we do that? There. Okay, Esau's desperation was a step toward his demise. All right, thanks. We have a great tech team. Will you give the tech team a round of applause? Woo! All right, now I don't know where I am at all. Okay, bad, unrecognized enemies. Thanks for the, thanks for the looks on your faces. People in the front are going. Super helpful. So I went to visit my mom just a few years back. My mom's passed away now, but uh, in her last uh, several years, she lived really close to us so that we could visit her a lot and help take care of her and stuff. So I visit her at her uh, little apartment at the retirement center and uh, popped in, quick knocked on the door, went inside. She was in a back room and she said, Mark, I'm so glad you're here. Come, I need your help. 
come in here. And so I walk in, and she's on her computer, and she said, there's a guy on the phone, and he, somehow my bank account got messed up, and so they, they deposited some, but they're, and they took some out, but they're trying to get it back into my account. So he's trying to help me get this money back into my account. And I remember looking at the screen. We weren't moving the cursor. The cursor was getting moved on her computer. I mean, this is a scam. How many of you are mad right now? Right. So, and I quickly saw this and said, oh, mom, and basically... What I told her very uh, quickly was, Mom, this guy is not trying to help you. He's trying to steal from you. And then, you know, she was like, oh. Um, but I share that story to get back, now to get back to the text. Esau and Jacob, Jacob is not trying to help Esau with his hunger issue. He's trying to steal from him. We're going to talk a little bit about enemies. Jacob is capitalizing on Esau's urgent difficulty, vulnerability. By the way, if you go two chapters farther in Genesis, Jacob also steals Esau's blessing from his father in a real manipulative way. So the reality is here in these accounts, Jacob is not enemies. Jacob is not Esau's friend. He's an enemy. So this reminds us of the reality. And I do think for some of us, we need to adjust our worldview and understand this. There are people, organizations, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms that are not your friend. That's the big point of this second thing. That are not your friend. The word enemy or enemies is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. That means about every third page, there's a story or a scripture that's clarifying in this situation there are some enemies involved. And I think that helps us balance the common understanding. There are some uh, circles that would talk about the Bible, and the Bible is a book of love. Yeah, some. Some of the Bible also describes things like there's enemies in the world. And the Bible also uses fairly frequently Language like beware, protect, or it's time to fight. And that's because the reality of our world is there's enemies. A little side thought. In heaven, heaven's going to be awesome because there will be no enemies. But in this life, there's going to be trouble and there are enemies. And we would be dumb, foolish to not understand that. Here's a fill in the blank. Life will have minimal success if we live unguarded, unguarded, oblivious to the reality that there are some people, some situations that are not there to help us. They're there for their own benefit or just to hurt us. Recently, I did a talk at a men's event here at the church. We talked about Adam and Eve and in a nutshell, we talked a little bit about why in the world didn't Adam just recognize that the serpent was an enemy and do something other than let his wife just stand there and talk to him, right? Grab a stick, beat the snot out of the snake, do something. Besides, oh, wow, this is interesting. So here's a question. Are there unidentified snakes <laughs> slithering around my life. Just enemies. And I don't know that, I'm not trying to provoke us all to run around like this every day, like, ooh, wait, ooh. But I am trying to challenge us. Are you aware enough to uh, protect, resist? Think 
Think of the different roles that you have. Some of us are responsible for kids, family. Staying aware that there are enemies out there of your kids. We had one of our kids, you know, grew up, and they did the school thing. And remember one, they had some great teachers. But I remember one teacher I identified early on. I thought, I think you're an enemy of my kid. And so I treated the situation differently. There was not as high of trust. Does that make sense? Like, some of you think, oh, you're being mean. I'm not being mean. I'm just trying to live in the real world where there are enemy type people there, and we should adjust. You should adjust for your sake, for others' sake, for your neighbor's sake, for your friend's sake. Just don't forget there are people and situations out there that are enemies. Even in the book of 1 Corinthians, Chapter 13, we would commonly refer to it as the love chapter. It has all these warm, wonderful characteristics of love. Love is patient, kind, doesn't boast, it's not proud, it doesn't dishonor people, self-seeing, and it's not easily angered. But look at the one that sometimes I think maybe we would forget. It says love always, you say it, protects. Protecting is part of what love does. So we'll finish our time. I'm going to give you some ideas of how to protect yourself if you find yourself in the presence of an enemy. These are also guarding type activities. So here's one idea. Walk away. Just walk away. Esau would have been better off when Jacob said, let's talk about birthright. Esau should have just said, no, got up from wherever he was, Go to a different tent, go to a different place, and make himself a sandwich or something. Like, don't have this conversation. Just get up and leave. Second idea, pray. You can write that in. Pray against. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. By the way, I know the development of a prayer life is a process and a journey. Uh, if If you realize right now, even when I say pray, you're like, I'm not sure how to do that. Watch for different classes and opportunity and groups that we'll do at the church. Because one of the things we want to do is help each other develop the ability to pray. And by the way, prayer is sometimes the, the ability to fight for things and against things. The last idea is confront Sometimes if you're in the presence of an enemy or some, some uh, one or situation is out for no good, you confront. You can confront verbally. Sometimes in some uh, realms of protection, I think you can even confront physically. I remember years ago, uh, some of you know this, if you're in leadership, every once in a while someone just likes to complain to your face about what you're doing. Welcome to leadership. So... A uh, person came to my office and they started complaining about my abilities. And uh, I listened to him for about 25 minutes and was like, yeah, I could, I could get better at that. I could get better at that. Yep, hey, I'm trying real hard, but I could get better at that. And I remember about 25 minutes in, they uh, started to talk about my wife. Yeah, see? <laughs> you can talk about me all day long. In fact, you can come into my office and complain. I'll listen for quite a while. Um, And I remember when they brought up my wife and began that, and I said something like, whoa, stop. We are not going there. This conversation is over. And then I walked around my office. Three of you are going, ah, no. No, and I just, I just, with it, I said, stop right there. You will not, because I'm going to protect my wife. We confront those things. So those are some ideas on how you avoid bad deals. You want to get that phone, or you want me to get it? Hello? Hello? What would thou need from me? 
Why don't you stand?